this is this is what he would have looked like. So Jesus wasn't white. He wasn't blonde. He wasn't blue-eyed. He was a Palestinian Jew. As a matter of fact, he probably looks a little more like me than, you know, uh, an Anglo, I guess. But uh, this is who he is. This is who he might have looked like. This is what a first century Palestinian Jewish person man would it look like yes that actually matches the picture in my head better than the blue eyed blondes because years ago somebody i don't remember whether it was a minister sunday school teacher or who but they made the point that when they came to get him and gethsemane they had to ask which one he was he mm -hmm. looked like everybody else exactly sure you know so to me when i see this picture and i'm not saying this is jesus but it kind of it kind of gives me an idea of, of him walking through Nazareth and him going to Capernaum and and interacting with with the people, interacting with his disciples. It, it, it puts a face, if you will, on on uh, who Jesus was. These are just uh, FYI. Uh, this is one of the earliest paintings from the Roman catacombs, about 300 to 350 A.D. And you can see Jesus clearly didn't have long hair, uh, the way they. You know, uh, visualize them even so close as the um, 300s. Um, this is the the earliest surviving painting of Jesus, and it's kind of hard to see. But if you notice the detail of, of Jesus there standing on that on that platform, uh, he has uh, short hair. He had typically, more than likely, in the first century, they, they tended to not have long beards, uh, but, but short beards. Um, and so there, there there's a difference in our in our understanding of his humanity when. When we look at Jesus as what he may have looked like in, in the first century. Okay, let me move to uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 through 10. And we're going to you know, get into the more, um, uh, the meteor part of, of his humanity. So in Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 10, we read this. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped or exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him, and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So why, why is it important to not miss the reality of the humanity of Jesus? Well, because here we see clearly that Jesus emptied himself. This, this word empty is from the Greek kenao, which literally means to make empty or take away the power or significance of something. Jesus emptied himself voluntarily of divine privilege. He never ceased to be divine. He never ceased to be God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. He never ceased that. He never ceased to be divine. What he did do was voluntarily kenao. He emptied himself of divine privilege. Um, I'm not a huge fan of it, but I know that in, in some of the the modern ultimate fighting, there's something called tap out, you know, where you tap out if you're if you're already getting choked or you're already getting you know you're you're pinned, and so you don't want you don't want to continue. You tap out, you tap out that way. You know they'll they'll let you up. They'll, they'll they'll release you. So Jesus didn't tap out of of his humanity. You know he didn't feel the sting of rejection or the sting of jealousy or the sting of lust or the sting of whatever it was he was tempted with. He didn't feel that and tap out and say, okay, Father, let's let's ease back on the humanity for today. Let me let me have some angels transport me from Nazareth to Galilee. So I won't have to walk. He never did that. He never tapped out from his humanity. That's what that's what the Apostle Paul is saying when he says that he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or exploited. Some versions say taken advantage of. That would have been a very different humanity. That is exactly the power of the humanity of Jesus. And when I, when I finally realized that and began to wrestle with that, it became very true in my life. And it, it changed my life. It changed the way I approach Christ. And I hope that as I share the last couple of points, it may spark something in, in you as well. Because again, we're, you know, when I come to communion, when I come to worship, when I come to a baptism, when I come to 
pray, when I come to Sunday school, when I come to talk about, about Jesus, you know, seeing Him high and lifted up on His throne is wonderful and it's rightly so. But to think of Jesus as a human, in human form, our Savior is in human. As a matter of fact, we believe that even theologically and eschatologically, Jesus is still in bodily resurrected form. Because Stephen said in Acts, I see Jesus standing. Remember he said that? I can see Jesus standing next to the throne. In the book of Revelation, we see images and, and, and language of Jesus sitting on the throne as the Lamb. Jesus, you know, standing with the Father. And Jesus coming. As a matter of fact, when, when the angels come and, and tell the disciples, just the way you see Jesus ascend, what do they say? Just the way you've seen him ascend, <clears throat> that's how you will see him descend. He ascended in bodily resurrected form. So we believe that Jesus retained his resurrected, glorified body because he had become one with us in humanity. Any questions so far before I continue? Okay. So then, what does all this mean for us? What does all this mean for us? You know, I think I think Scripture in Philippians, you know, makes it clear that Jesus didn't use his divinity as something to be grasped. That's why I'm talking about the omniscience, and I mean, um, uh, to be omniscient is not a, a human quality. To be omnipotent is not a human quality. Um, to 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 have divine power is not a human quality. So if Jesus wanted to fully 100% experience his humanity. You put that along with Philippians chapter 2, and we have to say, no, Jesus was not omniscient because of what Paul says. He didn't use that as something to be grasped. Now, how did Jesus, in some parts of the gospel where it says, and Jesus knew their thoughts. Remember that he, he, when Jesus knew their thoughts, or he told somebody of uh, Nathaniel, I saw you when you were sitting under the fig tree. You know, how did, how did he know those things? Well, Jesus, you know, was, was so in tune with the Father through the Holy Spirit that things were revealed to, to, to him. Why did Jesus go and be baptized by John? The baptism of John was for repentance of sins, right? Why would he go and be baptized? The Holy Spirit, as an example for us. Exactly. I mean, he, he, in every sense, he wanted to feel what we felt. I mean, it was kind of, you know, Jesus acknowledging and not acknowledging his, his sin, right? I mean, he, he was not, you know, there because he needed a repentance of sin, he was, being the, he, he was there because he was standing with each one of us as a, as a human who needed to be baptized. And in the process, we see that the Holy Spirit comes upon him and he is filled with the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus' reliance and dependent, dependence on the Holy Spirit is what ultimately got him through his life and, and his ministry. He learned to lean upon the ministry of the Holy Spirit in his life to reveal things to him, to empower him, to equip him. And so that's why he gives us that example. So in, in a way, that, that really raises the bar for us because Jesus, God never said, you know, you all be as divine as I am. No, he says, be as human as I was. And to rely on the Holy Spirit um, for guidance. So what does this mean for us? In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, we see these words. And we're going to get to, uh, someone made a, a comment about the temptation. And, and this will be part of what will address it. So... Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. It says, Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, that is, mm -hmm. humanity, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect. In what respect? In every respect. Does that include our sexuality? Does that include our emotional life? Does that include our psychological life? Does that include every dimension of our lives? It says every respect. I mean, I don't know how well every is pretty much the same in Greek, Spanish, and English, you know. In every respect, he became like us so that and here's the purpose when he sees so that in bible study that's a purpose statement he became like us in every respect 
<laughs> Here's a purpose. So that was tested or tempted by what he lived and suffered, he is able to help those who are being <coughs> tested. Brothers and sisters, if we, if we embrace that with all of our hearts, and I'm telling you, when I, and I'm not saying I have accomplished this 100%, but when I began to see the light of this, that Jesus lived and felt my humanity in every way, that did something for my walk with Christ. Because then, then I knew that if I went to Jesus and said, Lord, I, 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 I feel weak here. That he was not going to say, okay, let's, let's, you know, let's, let me turn to scripture. He'll say, I know exactly, I know exactly what you feel. I feel tempted to do this, or think that, or go there, or do this. Lord, you know, I knew that I was praying to someone. Not foreign to my humanity, not distant to, not somebody who could tap out from humanity, but somebody who in every respect... Think about what that means and contextualize that for our lives today and for our young people today and for this generation and for our culture. In every respect, Jesus was tested and tempted and felt every fiber of our humanity. That's why he is able to help us. That's why he's able to help us. Yes, sir. Getting back to something asked earlier, a, tempt a temptation therefore is not a sin unless it is acted upon. Correct. Okay. Correct. Jesus never succumbed to temptation, and like I said, we can we can easily talk about you know what temptation is and how far temptation goes, and at what point does it become a, a, an action. But with Jesus, it was there was temptation. Hebrews is clear that there was temptation, but never culminated in in sin. Yes. The part of that to me that is so was, was was so obedient. He was, you know, so uh, submissive to the will of the Father that he was able to pray and say, "Lord, here here is this opportunity, you know, as a time." And the Spirit said, "Go, go out to this lake and walk," um, because there was such a an intimate uh, communion, and so that that kind of you know, it's challenging for us. I, I always think, and maybe you think the same way. If I had to, if I had to rate my degree of obedience and submission to God through the Spirit on a daily basis, ten being, man, I'm in tune with God, right there. On a scale of one to ten, how submissive and obedient am I to the Father's voice, to the Spirit? Where would you gauge yourself on? I mean, you don't have to just think about that. I, I'll, I'll be transparent. I think, man, I. I'll be happy if I'm at a three sometimes. I mean, I'll be happy if I, which, 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 which motivates me to think, gosh, what, what if, what if I was a five or six? What, what, what could God do in my life? And that's one of the things that I, that I think about in talking about the humanity of Jesus, how it changed my life. And it says, gosh, David, you, if you were just a little more committed, if you were just a little more obedient, if, you know, look what God has done with your mediocre commitment sometimes. Look at, look what God has done with your half-hearted um, entrega. How do you say entrega in English? Um, Elaborate. Sorry? Elaborate. No, like uh, commitment. commitment. Let's say yeah. commitment. You know, how can, how can, you know, God uses me even when I'm at a two or three. What if I would really, for his glory, strive to be at a five or six? What if the church worldwide would be at a five or six? Where would we be? Where would Coker be if as a whole we would be at a five or six. I mean, I'm not trying to play with numbers, but you, you understand my point. So Jesus, Jesus strived to be every moment in tune with the Father through the Spirit. And so he shows us the model of what truly we could be doing in the Lord. I mean, that doesn't mean we're going to feed 5,000. doesn't mean, I mean, it just means what the Father's going to do in us and, and through us. And so um, I think that that's part of what, what I would... I would say. Does somebody have a hand or oh, three hands? Okay. Was here, there any, here, there. Was there any, any any examples of the Holy Spirit entering Jesus before the baptism? No. No. And that's that's So he was a hundred percent human. That's intentional. Yeah, I mean God's God, you know, the Father was with him and, and, and all that. <coughs> but immediately when that baptism happens, he is he is led into the wilderness 
and his, his uh, ministry begins. And ironically, his ministry begins with a huge temptation on his humanity. I mean, hunger and, you know, uh, uh, there, there's, a, there's a guy named Leonard Sweet. Who's a, I like, I like, he writes very well. Uh, very contextual, very culture-oriented. And he says, you know, if you want to know how important worship is, ask the devil. <laughs> Whoa, you know, because the devil says, you know, he led Jesus up to this high mountain. All of this is mine. And he showed him the kingdoms, the world, right? The principalities. All this I give you if you'll do one thing. Worship me. I mean, that's how much it meant to the devil. It meant everything. And he says, and Leonard Sweet says, you know, he didn't say I'll give you everything except Las Vegas or Atlanta or anything like that. Everything is yours if you just, just worship. That's all you got to do. And the truth is, if you would have worshipped, you would have gotten the whole world. And all that the devil was but, that would have thwarted God's plan, right? But Jesus' humanity was tested right off the bat. As soon as he was, 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 was uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, first thing that happens, according to the Gospels, is he goes to be tempted. His humanity is, is tried with, with hunger. And, and all that, that the devil said when he showed him all the world, that's all the world, if you know what I mean. I mean from A to Z. Here's the humanity. It's all yours. Could he have been presented with all kinds? Sure. Everything was presented to Jesus. So, uh, yes. I'll I think pick. Luis's question and some of your points, uh, the disciples did almost everything that Jesus did, except for whether, uh, perhaps, uh, they were able to through the Holy Spirit. Uh, Good and point. Jesus is Good point. Look at the, able to do most of those same things. Look at the book of Acts. Yeah. You look at the book of Acts and you look at, you know, um, all the, and, 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 to be truthful, I mean, you know, today, the, the Spirit moves in mighty ways. I mean, we can see. We can see how the, the Spirit continues to move in, in powerful, in mighty ways, including miracles and including other ways that, that, that today we see the Lord. Somebody had a hand over here. I, did, yes. I was going to make the same point, that the disciples then take Christ's example completely into our humanity with exactly. what they could do. I mean, right. it's like we get the complete picture of yes. what can be. And you know, and, and and you know, to me, it's it's, it's kind of scary because now God says, "Okay, David, what's what's your excuse?" I mean, I I'm not asking you to be at a ten plus plus like my son was. I mean, you you be as human and committed, you know, and and, 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 and where you are and what you're doing. And to be honest, if if I were to be honest with myself, I, I've fallen way short. I've fallen way short of, of what anybody can identify with that. <laughs> Two people, three people. Okay. Yeah, we all right. We we. I mean. And, and again, it, it, it just begs the question, can you imagine, you know, and, and I believe it can happen, that Coker as a whole, you know, maybe not every single, but as a whole, if we could get to the point where we're all in one accord at a five or six, and we're really sold out to win the world for Christ and to make an impact and to transform the world, not for our own sake, but for the kingdom's sake and for God's glory. Can you imagine what can happen in our, in our midst, right? Uh, but yet, ironically, Many times, it's precisely our humanity that gets in the way, right? Because our humanity is about who? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I didn't get too much out of that service today. I didn't get too much out of this. I didn't get too much out of I, you know, and so it's really about we and what I can do as part of the, of the body also that, that counts. Let me, let me begin to wrap it up because I see the time. So that's why he can help us. And one, one, one last verse I want to share is also there in Hebrews chapter 4, a couple of chapters back. Uh, or ahead, um, verse 14 through 16. Very similar. And so you, you kind of wonder why he, the, book of the, the writer of Hebrews uh, emphasizes this more than once. He says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but rather we have one, again, who in every respect has been tested or tempted, yet without sin. And here's the power, power key verse. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. Amen. 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 Do you ever feel a need for help and temptation in your humanity? Do you ever feel a need for grace and mercy? I do. 
Isn't it wonderful to know that when we do come to the Lord, He is able to help us. Jesus knows how hard it is to be human. He knows how hard it is to be human. And I hope that as we come to the table this morning, that in the back of your mind you'll have this presentation. That Jesus, as, as we break the bread and as we remember what Jesus did, it was not only what He did through the Father, but also He took our humanity. His very humanity was broken so that our humanity might be restored and be healed. We have a Savior and a God who fully understands our humanity, and that's why, that's why He can help us in our time of need. That's the power. That, that will preach, brothers and sisters. <laughs> that will preach. We have a Savior who can help. And let me just finish with a short story. I remember, I remember in college, and I, I've shared this at, certain, at other times, I needed, I needed college algebra to graduate from college. And college algebra and I are like water and oil. I mean, we, and I, I, I know it's going to sound humorous, but it was a mental block. It was really a mental block. Like, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I mean, I got through everything else. So, of course, as a, as a, as a very, you know, wise person at, at, you know, 22, 23 years old, I'll just take it at the end. <laughs> so here I was. So here I was stuck, you know, and I had to take through the course of my college years, I think I took college algebra, and I say this, you know, with no pride whatsoever. I took it about four or five times. Wow. You know, withdraw here, withdraw there. Was, you know. And then finally, I remember hearing a teaching on this. And I remember going to my apartment, and I, and I knelt down, and I said, you know, Lord, I, I don't know if you ever took algebra. <laughs> I don't know, but I do know that you felt every fiber of our humanity. And you were frustrated. And I know that I know that you know how I feel. All I ask is for you to help me get through this class. So I went with a new attitude. I prayed, did all those things. A good friend of mine said, look, he gave me a very good tip. What you got to do is you, you, know, you get out of that class, go straight to the tutoring lab, and you do your homework at the tutoring lab. Get one of those people to be your best friends. Buy them coffee, buy them whatever, and let them walk with you this journey. And I did exactly that. After class, I walked out of there after hearing these guys. Some of these professors are unsympathetic, not like Jesus. These guys are unsympathetic, man. They don't, they don't care. Anybody have any questions? And then you kind of, you know, because they, they'll, they'll say, well, I already said that. Next question, you know. So, so I went to this, to this lab, and this guy who had a, a long hair, deceptively a good guy, he showed me the insight and the tricks of, of algebra, I mean, to my level. The first test that we took was a 98. I got a 98. I got the second highest score in the class. I couldn't believe it. I, I, I was shocked. Right? Of course, the first test is always easiest, right? Of course, from there, they started to, the next one was like an 85, next one lies, you know. But I had that 98 to kind of help me out. You know, that, that was what I, I went and I finished that semester and I graduated with a, with a B minus, enough to get credit for that semester and be able to graduate. But my point is, you know, I can't tell you how many times, how many times I walked into the door of that class and under my breath, in my mind, in my heart, I said, okay, Jesus, I know you're here. I know you have felt my humanity. Walk with me again. And it seems minute. It seems insignificant. But to me, it meant everything because I was able to graduate. Amen? Amen. And my, my wife-to-be was waiting, so I had to, you know, no pressure, right? No pressure. But brothers and sisters, I believe that this right here, <clears throat> there's power in the message of the incarnation, that Jesus felt every fiber of our humanity it doesn't matter if you're learning to ride a bike. It doesn't matter if you're trying to learn how to use a smartphone. It doesn't matter if you're trying to overcome an addiction. It doesn't matter if you're trying to overcome fear or anxiety or whatever it is. Jesus Christ knows exactly how we feel, and He is able to help us and walk with us along the way. Amen? Amen. There is power in the incarnation of God the Son. The fact that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, became fully human, and therefore... Can help us. I pray that this has been a blessing to you in a small way, that Jesus being fully God was fully man, fully human as well. And that is something we can grasp onto. That is something 
we can exploit and we can just hang on to Jesus and his humanity and be able to be comforted in knowing that he walks with us as we struggle, as we wrestle, as we celebrate in the wonderful and not so wonderful of times, Jesus helps us in our humanity. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.